All right, space fans, we are ready for another After Action report from a visit to the Buclidian universe. A couple of weeks ago, I came across this really interesting phenomenon, hard sync. And of course, everybody thinks they know what it means. But when you look online, when you look at Wikipedia, when you look at uh, music.stackexchange.com, you find that actually different synth vendors implement synchronization in completely different ways. And I found my first mystery, which was what makes the Buchla hard sync sound the way it sounds. So let me give you an example here. Here we have a principal oscillator. Pretty boring. And we can use that principal oscillator and we can sync it against a, um, a modulation oscillator that is tracking a variable pitch. All right, so there's the variable pitch. And right now, we don't have any sync on at all. So the modulation oscillator is just free to run. And all it's the only relationship to the principal oscillator is the beginning pitch of that principal oscillator. All right, so if we wanted to change the pitch, we can do that. All right, now let's put on hard sync and notice what happens. It sounded a little bit like an ascending pentatonic scale, and I bet you're wondering, what's up with that? I wondered that too, and I went in search online to try to figure out whether or not hard sync actually somehow uh, magically had the pentatonic scale contained in some, I don't know, Diophantine equation. I did some I did some research. I corrected an entry on musicstackexchange.com. I looked up this uh, guy's doctoral thesis that talked about uh, what are the harmonics of a classic hard sync. But it turns out that the Buchla hard sync is not a classic hard sync. In fact, it's, it's really different. Using Audacity and a little bit of uh, analysis, what we discovered was that the Buchla hard sync only functions in hard sync if the synchronization occurs in about the first 10% of the open window. So if you are not getting a, a, um, a synchronization change from the principal oscillator within the first 10% of the modulation oscillator's waveform, then it's going to ignore it and it's going to wait. And so what ends up happening is that across large uh, ranges of these potential synchronization points, unless you actually sort of catch the gears where you will repeatedly hit that first 10%, the gears don't catch and you don't hear the hard sync function. What is it that causes those gears to catch? Integer ratios. What do integer ratios give us? The harmonic sequence. What does the harmonic sequence give us? The pentatonic scale. Mystery solved, somewhat. But now, let's listen to this uh, in a little bit of context. And what we're going to do, what I did, is I organized my little 250E here. As you can see down there, I set up a bunch of different starting points for the initial pitch and the limit high pitch, and that's coming out of our CV1 slot right there. And then what I did is I sort of tuned things up a little bit using a couple of these more funds. So what we do with the more funds is we select the low note and the high note, low, 
pi, and we have a little 256E that allows us to set the range of the sweep from more funds low to more funds high based on a simple linear curve. So what happens is we have a quadrature mode that gives us an initial pulse that rises nice and slowly so we can hear all those gears catching and then it'll uh, it'll hold that for a little bit then it'll release and go back to the root pitch so that we just have some melodic grounding in terms of what our bass note is. So let's listen to these things working together. Another question you might have is, well, what about soft sync? What does that do? And the answer there is also a little bit counterintuitive. Let me explain. So the claim is that soft sync uses a phased lock loop to sort of um, gearbox the beginning of the modulation oscillator with the uh, cycling of the principal oscillator so that they kind of beat together. That's not actually what happens. What actually happens is that every time the principal oscillator hits that reset condition, the modulation oscillator waveform simply reverses. Now, by reversing, that means that it never has a true discontinuity in the waveform. So if the waveform is busy coming down, it's going to have a mirror inflection point and it's going to start going up. If it was at a minimum, it's going to re recover from that minimum and, and go back up. So at any point in time, any time that principle interrupts, you're going to get basically a duplication of that initial uh, voltage, uh, anal uh, audio voltage, but then it's going to go backward through the wave or back again, forward, et cetera, et cetera. And that still can produce a very interesting timbre because now all of a sudden we're, we're folding the waves. So let's hear what that sounds like. All right, and we can put the low note in there just so we can hear it. Soft sync is not a phase lock loop. It's basically a mirror re reversal, and that is something that Wikipedia talks about. The hard sync is uh, something which hits only during a particular open window. That's not something I've seen documented elsewhere, but that's how it works. So that was the first excursion into the Buclidian universe. And I got all excited. Hey, I can now make a video. This is going to be really cool. People are going to be excited about it. Except I couldn't make a video because I had sent some of my uh, bits from my RED cameras to be serviced. And so couldn't actually shoot a video. So I was waiting a couple of weeks. And while I was thinking about this audio synchronization function, I was looking at various other videos online. And I noticed something that is really the analog of audio hard sync in the control voltage world, and that is control voltage sync, pulse trains. 
So this is a different part of the Buclidean universe, a completely different part, but you'll see that they're actually really related. So first I wanna draw your attention to this little setup here, this 281. So what we're seeing here, the top function generator is basically uh, being driven by this little low frequency uh, oscillator. So it's receiving its pulses uh, from time to time. And uh, when, the, when we get enough voltage on that input, it gives us a pulse and you can see that pulse on that top blue LED. That's great. Now, in addition to generating a pulse, we also generate a voltage according to the attack and decay parameters. We've got a slow attack, we've got a slow decay. And so you can sort of think of this as the pulse is just instantaneous and then the attack and decay sort of come up and, and go down. But look at what's interesting. When, uh, when our voltage goes high down here in our, um, with our modulation oscillator, we actually get the bottom unit turns on before the top unit does. And you might ask yourself the question, how is it possible? So now what you're noticing is that the C unit turns on first and then the B unit comes on quick. Click, C is on and click. C is on and click. Okay, so what's going on here? What's going on is that the pulse is not released until the attack and the decay cycle are finished. So you gotta wait for the whole wave to go by before you can register a pulse. But the voltage coming out the top here, as it goes high, even before it reaches its maximum, it gets to a point that gets sensed as a legitimate trigger for our C input. So what we're seeing there is that C actually receives a pulse as the attack is going up and we don't get a full pulse until the decay has gone all the way down. Now, why is that important? It's important because it means that our function generator can really generate a, uh, something registering as a pulse either at the beginning of its wave or not exactly at the beginning, but somewhere along the track. And I'm gonna say like 90% of the way through the attack or it can generate that pulse later on. And that plays a really fascinating role in building something called a pulse train. So a pulse train basically is where you have a sequence of these function generators and the output of one drives the, um, drives the trigger of the next and so forth and so on. And depending on how you set up your ratios of attack and decay, the pulse train can produce some really interesting results. Let's, uh, let's head over to the left-hand side and see that in action. All right, so here on the left-hand side, we've got the attack of the top function generator going into the first gate of the uh, dynamics manager and we're hitting just the pulse, which means we're getting a super short pulse cycle. And then the output of A feeds the trigger of B, the output of B feeds the trigger of C, and the output of C feeds the trigger of D. But something else happens. We add up the voltages coming from B, C, and D. We add them here to produce a stored random voltage, which is triggered by the pulse. So this is where things get interesting. Because the pulse is happening at the end, the pulse is sampling something that's happening later in the pulse train than at the very beginning. So the pulse train has a chance to have a bunch of different attacks and decays uh, creating different voltage levels at the moment that the first pulse, sorry, that the first uh, function is completed. And so this is kind of interesting. And what happens is if we change the attack and decay parameters, if we make the attack slower, 
and that's going to give the train a chance to actually jump the tracks and get ahead of the pulse. If we make the attack really, really fast, uh, then uh, everything really happens very much up at the front. Now that B unit basically controls how much um, uh, de delay we have before we really launch the train and the D unit at the very very bottom dictates what sequence of notes we play while the pulse is actually open. The C unit is not only feeding our um, our voltage uh, accumulator but it's also triggering the D unit of our dynamics manager which is giving us the second note. So let me give you some examples of how this messes around. If I slow the train down, uh, sorry, if I, if I add some attack to the B, then what's going to happen is, is um, we're going to begin to overlap the pulse train with the pulses. What you sort of notice there is the um, we're now starting to intersect. We've got a rhythm going where we go from low to high, low to high. That high note is happening because our pulse train is intercepting basically the ball in the air. But if we actually uh, go a little bit further, we can knock the ball up a couple of times. Here, you can see that our pulse train is actually catching multiple, uh, multiple triggers as the voltage rises. But we can go even farther than that. doing is instead of slowing the whole train down uh, to catch this what we're doing is we're basically juggling the pulses on the last car of the train and so we've got something open that gives us a chance to actually play with the voltage after um, we've uh, triggered the second uh, piece of the puzzle. sort of slowing down the attack and the decay. Anyway, there's a lot of different things you can play with here. But what's interesting to me about this is that fundamentally the way in which one constructs these sequence of notes that plays and the timbres that we get is really just like a question of how the synchronization lines up in order to produce the, um, uh, what we hear from the pulse train. The train itself is just a whole bunch of pulses moving through time but how we slice that time determines whether we hear something that sounds like bongos or sounds like synthesizers or sounds like bugs or anything else like that. So how are we doing all this? We have uh, a little harmonic generator. Now that's just a triangle wave and a square wave. That's really affecting the, um, the second wave 
the second tone. That's affecting the first tone, but also consequently the second. It's not very hard to see how this can quickly go from synth land to bongo land to tabo land to oud land. All of these different sounds are possible depending on how these uh, functions work. Let's take a closer look at some of the details here in our pulse train. So what we've got set up right now is we've got the top unit, the top function generator, setting that pulse straight down. And because all the attacks are really, really short, and most of the decays are really, really short, what's happening is, is that that pulse is just rifling straight through and it's hitting everybody basically at the same time. And we're not getting anything very interesting because we've got a low note tuned in and we're basically just getting um, a pair of pulses uh, very low. Now, if we slow down the B function generator, what's going to happen, and we're, if we slow it down, especially with the attack, if we slow down the decay, uh, it's going to recycle. So as you can see there, it never gets a chance to go all the way down. It's just constantly recycling. And in fact, what this is doing, this is elevating our pitch. Sorry about that. Now it's elevating our pitch. Okay, now notice that because we're never actually going all the way down to zero, we're never actually triggering the C and the D units. Okay, so now, now at least we're triggering the C and D units. Because of that fast attack, it's rifling right through. It's, it's just going straight through the pulse train. Everybody's getting that same first pulse. So now, instead of lengthening the decay, let's lengthen the attack. Now here the attack is slow enough that um, it's actually going to inhibit uh, 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 some of the pulses from A because it's still busy rising and so it doesn't actually see those pulses while it's still rising. And the result now is you can see that different rhythm between the A and the C. Let's make that rhythm even more different. ratios happening. So we can see that that B function generator can sort of dictate whether the C unit is going to follow A directly or is going to be some um, integer or fractional relationship with it. Three against two, four against three, uh, three against five, whatever. There they are really close. Now, let's play the same game, but with the D side.
Now what's happening is uh, we've got a rhythmic relationship between the attacks in the D and the top unit, but because of the pitches, what it sounds like is it sounds like we've got a different rhythm even though um, what is giving us the rhythm is the A and the C triggers. So D is now just controlling pitch and the pitch is making it sound like there's a rhythmic difference. Now again, what we're doing by slowing that attack, we're accumulating more voltages into our accumulator and that's giving us a higher pitch. All right, now let's, uh, let's look at what happens when we bring these two things together. So there we've got about half speed going. Okay, there it is, offset rhythm. There we have an offset rhythm, which is actually sort of in sync, so we're not getting different notes. But let's throw it a little out of sync. So again, here you can see that we can um, change the course of the pulse stream upstream, or we can change its effect downstream. So just some examples of ways that you can play with that pulse train, how that first trigger signal either does or does not continue down the chain. And when you let the chain diverge a little bit with that first pulse just hitting that first note and the second one sort of doing its own thing, you get some interesting results.
infinitely many variations of rhythmic patterns. It just takes a little while to develop the intuition about how to adjust those parameters to get something interesting to go from one rhythmic lily pad to the next and not need to jump off too quickly.